Hello, everyone. Welcome again to our YouTube channel. Uh, always meeting with uh, Mr. Brent Tolmy, CEO of Carbonetic. How are you today, Brent? I'm well, thanks, Martin. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Was a great meet, uh, great weekend uh, on our way uh, to Yukon on the, this Wednesday coming, uh, meeting with our indigenous partners. And this is part of the discussion today. So quick video, Brent, I wanted to do uh, today is for our viewers to understand and get to uh, know a little bit better our partners, uh, the people which has been supporting Carbonetic basically since day one. Uh, so since day one, we've been working really hard, you know, to put everything in place, validate actually the quality of what we could deliver to market. Um, and from there, we sign an amazing agreement with indigenous partners of ours that we're going to discuss today. Without them, all of this wouldn't be possible uh, because they're the right landowners of the territory that we're going to, you know, work with uh, and partner with them. And also, we need financials to be able to support, right? We need these revenues that we can generate so we can push forward. And once again, great partner here that we discuss, we're going to discuss a little bit later. So let's start, Brent, with our ish, initial partners, the Cascade Dana community. Who are they? Who they do represent? What is the chunk of land that they rightfully own? Thanks. Uh, yeah. So when we first started, we knew that in order to unlock, in order to move the needle on climate change to, to do our part in forestry, we needed big landowners. And we understood that in Canada, we perhaps had the skill to navigate conversations with Indigenous partners um, who have ancestral right and claim to the land. And in British Columbia, where our first project is, there's actually a mechanism so outside of all the treaty talk that we hear about, there's a mechanism to actually get carbon projects up and running in the forest. And so we looked at a map and talked about who we had relationship with and, and started knocking on doors. And uh, because I've had a lot of experience working in the province of BC in renewable energy and forestry, uh, I knew some, some folks to talk to. And uh, through a friend of a friend, uh, came across a contact who is at uh, Liard First Nation uh, Denadelu Council. So Liard First Nation being in Watson Lake on the Yukon border, and then uh, Denadelu Council being in Lower Post, uh, which is just uh, about 20 kilometers south in British Columbia. And of course, uh, that indigenous group, well, they predate borders. So before there was a 60th parallel, there was a, uh, a, a cask of First Nation. Um, and they lived in different spots and uh, and then would get together, gather and, 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 uh, and commune together when they had the opportunity. So very interesting stuff. Yeah, great. This is uh, maps definitely help. So you can see that 60th parallel. So when we talk about our indigenous partners, uh, the Denike Kusan project, uh, that is between us and the three BC First Nations of, of the Casca. Uh, there are five nations, two in the Yukon. So one is Liard First Nation, and it's the, the largest, I believe, by population um, and resides in and around Lots, Watson Lake um, on the uh, on Liard River, on the Liard Plateau, obviously. And then up north, uh, about uh, four hours drive away, four or five hours, is Ross River uh, First Nation, which uh, if you wanted to landmark, it is close to Fair Oak. Yeah, there it is. Beautiful place. Um, and and so those are the two Yukon uh, branches of the Casca. And then in British Columbia, we have uh, Lower Post or Delu. And then we have Dees River First Nation. Uh, where are they located? Just to uh, give me a... Um... <laughs> to the left of the... Uh, to the left of your pin. Yeah, it's uh, Good Hope Lake is actually specifically where they're oh, at. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These lake, like that, that, that's the area. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you're driving down the Cassier Highway, Highway 37, uh, which many people do as a spectacular area, like nothing else on the planet, Cassier, of course, was a, was an old historical mine um, and a community that that closed down. And of course, Jade City. Uh, people might be familiar with it. There's actually a, a, a TV show. 
um, on the Discovery Channel that, that uh, shows the exploits of these jade miners that go out into the wild and try to find these large, amazing boulders that are, yeah, exactly, just jade carvings. It's really quite something. It's one of those iconic sort of holes in the wall that's worth stopping. So that that's really um, Good Hope Lake is before you get to Jade City. So that's uh, where the Dees River First Nation resides. Um, and then, of course, down in the south is Quidatcha, uh, which historically had the name Fort Ware, um, but is the community and, and uh, where the Quidatcha First Nation resides. Um, and so all connected historically by trails, by rivers and, and by common ancestry. And when we talk about in our Indigenous partners, uh, we would say that they have two things which are unextinguishable, right and title. So right uh, is a right that's granted by the current Canadian government to hunt, gather, uh, and to basically practice uh, how they've lived on their land since time immemorial. Title's a bit different, and that's the piece that we struggle with, um, you know, as, as the, the colonial immigrants that came over um, to sort out um, that this is Casca land um, and that... Uh, as we're seeing in Canada, land is being returned to the rightful stewards of the land. And uh, they have set aside a specific area inside of their traditional territory. So traditional territory is where they roamed the land, where they existed, where they looked after the land, where they cared for each other. And people grew up and people died on the land before roads, before infrastructure, before any of us showed up. So for you know the thousands and thousands of years. Um, and so if you're a uh, if you're a, a large indigenous group trying to make a, a life for yourself in the very far north, uh, you know, south and north of the 60th parallel, we're talking very northern B.C., southern Yukon, right up to mid Yukon and Northwest Territories, a small piece. You've got to roam quite a bit of land um, to find sustenance. You've got to chase animals, trap animals, and and find where it's good. And so they're very migratory as a nation. Mm -hmm. um, and they occupy 24 million hectares. Now, it's a bit of a nebulous term. We like hectares. Why do we like hectares? Because it's 10,000 square meters. Um, mm -hmm. So it works really well with the metric system. Um, but it's about two and a half acres. And an acre is 208 feet by 208 feet. So it gives you an idea of the magnitude when we say 24 million hectares. Um, most people are familiar with the U.S. Uh, state of Oregon on the Pacific coast in between Washington and California. So Oregon is about 24 million hectares. So the whole state of Oregon would fit inside uh, Casca territory, which is, is quite amazing. We think about that. Yeah, it's just a massive land mass. And if anyone who's you know, driven through from Seattle down to, uh, or Vancouver perhaps down to San Francisco, a large chunk of that drive is going through Oregon. Um, so we can appreciate just the vast amount of territory. So they've set aside 4 million of that, uh, of that area in, 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 in a proposed set aside called the Denike Kusan. Uh, which is, uh, it stands for always will be there. And basically it's a, it's, it's a piece of land that's at risk and it's something that's important for the Casca. They've decided to set it aside. Um, and that's where carbon fits in rather nicely because uh, as we know, uh, creating a park is, is a solution. But if we think about Banff National Park, Jasper National Park, um, there's been a lot of damage to the forests in those areas because of the lack of forest stewardship. Um, and it's not that uh, conditions weren't known. The mountain pine beetle epidemic approached the Rockies for 25 years before the, before the first tree was killed by that. Um, yet the government really didn't come up with a robust plan to address that. And so that's really what we've been working on is to say no to commercial harvesting because it is, it's an amazing source of fiber and instead set it aside, uh, protect it from, from perhaps disruptive wildfire uh, from uh, obviously commercial activity, from mining exploration, and make sure it's there for all Casca people to uh, to come. And, and the thing about the Casca is they have open and warm hearts and are very inviting and willing to uh, allow everybody to recreate on their land uh, so long as it's done in a thoughtful and meaningful way. And so that's the real piece that we want to emphasize is that there's real partnership in the stewardship with the Casca. 
So great partners, obviously we'd love to rinse and repeat with them, establish more projects, which is what we're going to the Yukon to, to discuss. Um, so very excited about that and uh, different Casca uh, member nations, uh, different flavors, different geographies, different history. So a lot of shared commonality, shared uh, beliefs and, and, and traditions and customs, but also five diverse communities. And so we're looking forward to speaking with Ross River and with uh, with these River First Nation face to face. Uh, so it's very exciting for us. Yeah, and, and uh, the momentum is changing. Uh, we feel it when we get there. You know, we we've been thought many years ago that we had conflicts with the indigenous communities, you know, being Canadian. And now you feel with the chiefs in place that they really want to reunite us under a beautiful land, which they are okay, as you say, for us to visit and be part of if we are respectful of that land the same way as they are. Uh, so they don't consider actually that land, Brent, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they don't consider that land being their land. It, they consider that land being our land, including us, part of it, if we are considering it and being careful about it, right? So that's that's the feeling I got when I was there and meeting with these uh, with these partners of ours. There's a saying that uh, you can find Casca members on the land, and I think why we've been able to build a successful relationship is not only because of um, because of the championship of of folks like Chief Schilling, Councillor uh, Porter, um, folks at um, the Denica Institute. Uh, who are just wonderful and uh, and all those other support people that I might be leaving out. Um, so we've been we've been openly welcomed, but we'll come to the land because of course this is the whole point of the project. And so there's an invitation to come to the land because that's what is is important and and there's a spiritual connection to the land with Casca. And I think we can both agree that we can sense it when we're there that this place oh, is yeah. special. It's yeah, unique. absolutely. And so there's absolutely an invitation and uh, that's been extended to us many times. So it really does feel um, not like, hey, it's it's our land, stay away, but come join us in our mission to set this aside and, and to make sure that it's here for all generations in the future, be them uh, indigenous or, uh, you know, folks that came over much, much later in our history. On that end, you know, like there's a there's a say uh, in the indigenous uh, culture saying that they are preparing, you know, decisions that they're making for today. And, and you can explain it way better in English than I do. But there is a say in their culture saying what decision we take today, it's to consider for the next seven generation to come. So you can give a bit of explanation on that. Sure. Uh, yeah. Seven generation thinking comes from from back east, some of the eastern tribes in in, uh, in upper Canada at the time. And um, the idea is, does this decision that I'm making today have impact for future generations? And if it does, then I really need to, to scenario plan or to map it out and decide if it makes sense seven generations from now. So not only for my kids, but my grandkids and their kids and on and on it goes right through to seven generations. And I, and I think what that does, um, because we often make the mistake of, of short term thinking um, or short term gain for long term pain, if you will. And I think what this does is it's a decision making framework that says, hey, it's not just about us um, and the decisions that we make have to uh, have to be sensible and have to weigh the impacts of what happens to people far and away uh, out from from when we pass on. And so just thinking about decisions and, and, th and I think that gets back to what we often say, which is how can we do different slash better? So it's not a critique of how things have been done in the past. It's just an, it's actually an invitation, much like the cask have in, yeah. invited us onto the land. It's that invitation to say, how, how can we make better decisions um, that aren't so short term or myopic, perhaps? Great. So thanks again for the great explanation. Uh, next. Uh, so first, uh, not to forget, um, I really highly suggest people, if you haven't seen that video, take the time, you know, to go on the YouTube of Deneke Kusan. I will link actually the link of the video in this video's description. So you'll be able to access it really easily. 
And why not invite your family, including your kids, to watch exactly what Deneke Kusan is. And you'll see the beauty of British Columbia up north, up to Yukon. And it will give you the opportunity uh, yourself to see exactly and feel these kind of culture mindsets that the people that we do business with have. So I think it's a great video they created. Uh, and, it, and again, it's going to be on the description of the video today. So just watch it. It's a really nice, beautiful, empowering video, in my opinion. Next, uh, so we needed, of course, financial partners and people who believe in what we are doing. And we've been very happy and proud uh, to meet with Invert Group last year. And uh, it's a very unique partnership brand, as you can explain to our viewers, because they have knowledge regarding the forest. They do understand actually the market that we are uh, involving and in, um, getting uh, involved in. And it's difficult to find a better partner to start than Invert has been because of their knowledge and their experience. Yeah, and I think... You know, I want to zoom out one step further and say, hey, how did this this all start? And and really, it was a coalition of um, of small dollar investors that believed in our mission and value that were willing to risk some capital with us um, to see if we could actually dream this dream together. And so I always want to acknowledge the people who made it real for us, yeah. um, who are willing to write checks. Um, as well as what we contributed to to make this into an actual business. Uh, it's one thing to, you know, to talk about it, to plan, to put up a website or have a pitch deck. It's another thing entirely that people would uh, write checks from their hard-earned dollars uh, because they believe in what we're doing. Um, and obviously there's a, a financial component, a payback, because it is an investment. But we always want to acknowledge that, that we would not be here uh, were it not for the good people. And predominantly people from uh, Martin's community uh, based in, in France and Switzerland, uh, as well as back east, um, that just understand a little bit better, I think, um, because of the development in Europe, perhaps, that uh, ESG, uh, environmental social governance and corporations, is very important. Carbon offsets are very important to help uh, with transition. And so we were lucky to benefit not only from your relationships, but also from um, from from a, that, I think, a different perspective, perhaps in North America. We're a little bit behind in, in our thinking compared to Europe on the matters of the environment and the climate. So now we can jump to invert. So, yeah. yes, I, I think we were uniquely attracted to invert. Um, because a lot of companies joined uh, the fight uh, against climate change or perhaps transition supporting industries, just doing better slash different. And uh, Invert, we saw as a company that had actually gone out and hired uh, folks and brought them onto their team that had immense credibility. And that's folks like uh, Chris Hyder and specifically for us, Matt Delaney. Um, Matt, of course, is, is uh, we would call him an OG of carbon standards. It's what he's done in his career as a forester. Uh, he's been involved in not only authoring standards, but also actually going out and figuring out how this thing works. So when companies like us came along three, four years ago, uh, guys like that had already been doing it for decades. And so we have a lot of respect um, for, that, uh, for that perspective. And then, of course, uh, we started the relationship with Mark Lawson, who's just a great human, great individual. And uh, we've had uh, a lot of great time with those folks online and, and working together to make this project real. And then, of course, uh, Andre Fernandez, the co-CEO. Um, so great people, Miranda Bryden and uh, Samantha Keys and, and uh, of course, Greg Latta and all the wonderful people that we've interacted over there. And, of course, they invert. Uh, they're in the business of buying and supplying carbon offsets, but they actually make a lot of investments in different segments of the carbon market. So they're very heavily invested as well into uh, biochar um, with Matt having uh, had a hand in writing one of the new standards as well. And them investing in a company called BC Biocarbon, uh, which is doing wonderful things in that uh, in that industry. So a lot of overlap. And when we see good people doing good things, then we're attracted to that. And so we were able to Kind of deal for some pre-purchase of credits as well as uh, a bit of equity so that uh, we could benefit from their expertise especially with from people like matt yeah uh, and chris and so it's been really just a, a great um, 
you know a great relationship to date and uh, we're right now they're they're helping us and we're helping them and and uh, it's a good thing to see progressive companies investing in this space yeah and the seriousness of uh you know like when they've done their due diligence last year uh the first thing happened was that uh, matt delaney that you're talking about we had the opportunity to meet uh, physically because he came to visit actually the project in BC. He wanted to validate the quality of the forest, see with his own eyes uh, how healthy actually the forest is and to quantify areas which we target and make sure that these areas can be protected and being taken care of. And as you said, on my personal behalf, I really appreciate it as well, Matt, as a human being. Uh, so aligned with our own values, core values within the company. And this is so far. So Matt has been, you know, the first initial physical uh, contact that we had with Invert um, because most of the team is in uh, either in the United States or in Toronto. So we've done most of our relationship, you know, virtually, except with Matt that we met. But Matt was, to me, the perfect representation of what Invert represents as well as values. And this is where you've got a great synergy in between two companies who want to be aligned, you know, and make sure that we are successful together. So it's just uh, it's just playing a very good, very good relationship since uh, we've been involved with these guys. Uh, anything else you wanted to add on that uh, on that end? No, I think. Um... Can I acknowledge another partner? Is that uh, please. Or, oh, please, yeah. absolutely do. Well, I think it's important to talk about uh, our work with the uh, province of British Columbia um, and and helping the Casca navigate uh, the Indigenous atmospheric benefits process. Um, it, it it takes a lot, obviously, for a government who's managed land in a certain way for quite a while. Um, now being asked to manage land differently. You know, 15 years ago, they established the process for what was called an atmospheric benefits sharing agreement, where the province would take a cut of the revenue from from carbon offsets. Uh, they've done away with that. It's now called an indigenous atmospheric benefits agreement. Um, and, and really, it's about Ministry of Forests and the Office of the Climate Secretariat slash Ministry of Environment coming together saying, all right, if we can sort of give land management back to these folks and they can show a benefit that is a benefit to you know all humans as well as British Columbians and there's a financial benefit for for um, you know for the indigenous group and the project developer then we're going to go ahead and support that so we've been working tirelessly um, with the folks from the government and there's a long list of folks, but specifically, I would say Shane Ford, who's been instrumental in, in, in leading the charge, as well as Ian, Ian Hollingshead, um, and then just various supporters um, from the different branches of government it takes to make this happen. And what we see is a lot of passion on their side uh, to write a different path. And so I, I just wanted to take my hats off to those folks um, who are largely constrained by legislation. I mean, essentially, when we vote, politicians into office, um, their job is to construct and vote on legislation. And so, and then the bureaucrats and staff have the, have to have the ability to navigate those channels. Um, and so work with great folks like Warren Greaves, who sits in the uh, office of, uh, of forest carbon uh, in the office of the chief forester for British Columbia. They're aware of this project um, and have given sort of the thumbs up, which is great. Yeah. Uh, as well, Katie Cox, who's uh, attached or sits in the office of the Climate Secretariat, and man, there's just a ton of other people to to thank and acknowledge. But certainly, they've been instrumental in helping guide this process. And and I think that in order to do uh, business like this in Canada and to work with the Casca towards their goals and ultimately our goals. Um, government is going to be part of it. And so we appreciate the people who are open for change and really pushing for that to, to happen. So just wanted again to, to acknowledge that relationship too. Yeah, great point. And thanks again for bringing it up. It's, uh, it's very important to us. Uh, so what's coming next? Uh, just a quick note. First, if you feel that your company is aligned with our core values as well, and you want to support actually developing some potential partnerships with us, you know, to protect the forest, to work actively with our other partners that we just mentioned, please reach us. 
Um, you know, we're opening, we're, we're open for business. We are preparing our 2024 season, you know, for 2025 carbon offsets delivery. Um, again, as partners with Invert, as partners with the British Columbia government, and of course the Cascadena Institute. Um, also, next week, uh, expect on our LinkedIn channel and YouTube channel a lot of content. Brent and I, we are hitting the road. We're going to Whitehorse uh, to meet actually with our indigenous partners. So we're going to uh, take the time being there, you know, to show the land, to show where we're going, what kind of conditions that these guys are living in, that we can see their communities. Uh, there's a job fair happening. And of course, we want to show these people our commitment, you know, to bring good jobs to them uh, through our forest project, which... Uh, is going to be uh, starting probably around June, depending of the winter, right? So depending of, because it's all related to season, seasonality. But when the snow melt, we're ready to roll and uh, we want to push forward, you know, for our seasons coming. So please reach us uh, at carbonetic.io and uh, I'll put as well my link, uh, my private email in there. So if you want to reach me, as the business developer for the company, please do. And uh, we'll have a proper introduction. So thanks again, Brent, for your time. Uh, let's meet for a beautiful week coming in uh, BC, up north BC plus Yukon, because we're going to be on both sides of, uh, of the border. And uh, let's keep watching for the future contents coming, guys. Thanks again for viewers. Brent, have a good one. And uh, talk to you uh, at the airport. See you soon. <laughs> See you, bud.